Hey there folks, Rel here. Today we're going to be talking about how to make monsters flavorful, purposeful, and easy to run in Dungeons and Dragons or other TTRPGs. So I believe that every good design starts with goals, so for the purposes of this video, let's start with three main ones. The first of which is that monsters should be purposeful. Why do they exist? Why are they interesting for the players to interact with? The second is that they should be flavorful. How do you convey why they do the things that they do? How do you convey uh, how the GM should run them? And the third is that the monsters themselves should be easier to run and also build encounters with. So if we pop on over to D&D Beyond, we're going to kind of iterate through our list of goals again and then talk about them a little bit. We'll start with a very basic rat. The purpose of a rat is not really to give you something to, to fight against. It's to provide a set of concrete stats that a player can look at and say, oh, this is how, this is what the rat does. So if you're a druid and you're trying to wild shape into a rat, this is useful information to know. Things like keen smell will give you, uh, you know, advantage on wisdom, perception checks that rely on smell. This is information that a player would want to know, but not necessarily something that a GM would use to run their game. If we move one step further, go over to a swarm instantly more interesting. The purpose of a swarm is in fact to fight the players. And because of that, they will have uh, you know some damage resistances here because they're a swarm, condition immunities because they're a swarm. The abilities uh, over here are because they're a swarm. The only thing that they retain from the rat stat block is the keen smell. So realistically, you could have taken this uh, swarm and turned it into a generic templatized stat block and you wouldn't really be missing much. As far as flavor, I think it tries to convey the uh, what a whole bunch of rats descending upon you would try to do, but it also doesn't do that in any remarkable way because it's leaning on the swarm mechanics, which are inherent to the vast majority, I think all of swarms, with very, very, very little change. Take it one step further. Let's go to a swarm of cranium rats. So cranium rats, very specific creatures. They are uh, telepathic. They have abilities that mention as much. Their attacks do a little bit uh, different damage, like they do psychic damage. They have spells that they can cast, and they have a bonus action that you know, does something too. Along with that, uh, there's a little bit of flavor here that tries to tell a GM how they could be using this character in the game. So some mind flare colonies use cranium rats as spies. The rats invade communities and act as eyes and ears, blah, 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 blah. Now, this is a good stat block. It feels purposeful in that it's a cranium rat, a swarm of them, and they have flavorful abilities that make it feel uh, specific to this type of creature. Doesn't make them easy to run, however. There are some attempts, and they're butting up against limitations of the, of the system when it comes to this sort of thing, and just how monsters have been done for the past however many tens of years. But it, uh, it makes it difficult in that you, as a GM, need to know what these spells do if you don't want to bog down the game. A lot of times we'll enter into a situation where we're trying to create an interesting encounter, and the monsters themselves are interesting, but there's also too much complexity when it comes to running them. There's too many things that you need to look up. There are uh, actions that don't really make sense for the encounter that we're trying to create. And a lot of times the complexity just gets pared down so that you just end up with not doing a bunch of stuff and it becomes a normal encounter again. So can this be done better? Yes. But first we should start with the problems because there are limitations. There's a very specific box that the designers need to work within. And this is not just for D&D, it's for any TTRPG that's out there. The first problem is page space. A very, very... Uh, mechanical, functional problem. But when it comes to creating a large stat block, it's going to take up a lot of space in your book. Online, not as big of a deal. But when it comes to actual pen and paper products, you are going to have to try to create language that is as concise as possible, while also, problem number two, running the system language. So the system language in D&D is that it's uh, you have a small name for an ability. It tells you what uh, the ability is kind of classified as. 
and then there's the to hit the reach how many targets it can hit and then the damage that it does and then there's if there's a uh, additional effects those are kind of listed beneath it uh you have actions you have bonus actions which are different categories for your uh your turn economy or action economy i guess um and you always need to list the armor class you always need to list the hit points and then this value over here you uh, always need to list the speed and this is always done in a block with a bunch of dead space over here the last problem that you butt up against is setting expectations i think some people would call it verisimilitude but a dragon should always feel like a dragon an ogre should feel like an ogre a, uh, a swarm should feel like a swarm and those are totally fine guidelines to operate within it creates harmony between what a player can go into an encounter feeling that they should do and how you meet and match those expectations when they actually uh, when you actually start fighting them so if you take a fire elemental and say like no 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 it's not uh it's actually vulnerable to fire something is wrong based on the expectations that we've created uh cultivated over the past however many years we've been gaming and the media that we've been exposed to and that sort of thing so there's just limitations that you need to operate within when designing monsters so I wanted to show you how we're handling monsters in the latest version of Distal. When it comes to monsters versus players, the combat is asymmetrical. Monsters are given a set of behaviors that are equivalent to the character's actions, but not one for one. Characters, by contrast, have more agency over the minutia of what they're doing because they're being controlled by a totally separate person. So when it comes to making an encounter that is easy to run, this is one of the ways that we handle it. Monsters in Distal are all tiered, so you'll see a tag tutorial here, Fragile Fodder, which just indicates what type of role they should be used for. Uh, they have a health, and then they have an alternate health pool, which is one that a GM can choose to use. If their party is uh, really ripping through health, if they want to make their encounters last longer, we encourage you, we give you permission to use these alternate health values based on the strength of your party. And this also means that you can take these lower tier monsters and then bump them up to a higher tier as well. You still have some similar uh, limitations when it comes to the language. Movement, we always state. Health, we always state. Defense, we always state. Challenge bonus, we always state. And this is like a global modifier for how difficult something is and uh, what you're going to be rolling against when they're trying to succeed saves and that sort of thing. And then you have some passive traits and behaviors. So it says 1d4 here because you can choose if you want to roll on that table and just see what the monsters want to do. Or you can uh, pick what makes the most sense for the situation. Every monster is given uh, at least one attack or something that feels like an attack because this is also used for their opportunity attacks. Uh, they are given uh, then a number of flavorful abilities that are befitting the type of fantasy that you're trying to create for this, in this case, a rodent swarm. When it comes to behaviors, the language is deliberately less technical than you'd find for a character and their abilities. The reason for it is that we've given the GM a number of shortcuts. So when we say in your space, it's within zero feet, or it's any space that you, if you're a large creature, happen to be spread over. If we say within reach, there's an assumption that every creature has five feet of reach unless there's another uh, ability that is stating contrary. We've created these sorts of shortcuts so that we can be uh, less technical, more verbose to create flavor with the specific attacks. So your incisors, you bite a target in your space for 1d4 piercing. When you overwhelm, you scramble onto a target in your space, blinding and muting them. And blinding and muting are keywords. Uh, unless they withstand, which is another keyword, this you know DC8 strength or fortitude effect they can scatter which allows them to evade opportunity attacks and move 10 feet as they flee to safety so again a little bit of verbiage that mentions what this creature would want to do it'd want to flee scatter run away very difficult to hit as they just like kind of you know panic and move away from you and they can also cause problems so they can uh, use one of these behaviors to knock over loose objects and spaces that they move through encumbering creatures in those spaces so encumbering is another keyword if you're creating an encounter and you want it to be interesting and varied 
you probably don't want to give something just a singular bite attack. You probably want to evoke the spirit of the monsters that you're trying to create through their behaviors. If you were to throw three of these rodent swarms in a room, the encounter would instantly be more interesting because some of them would be biting you, other ones would be blinding and muting you, some of them would be just trying to run away when they get into a bind, and then others just would be knocking over boxes and statues and whatever else to impede the party as they try to uh, get closer. So when it comes to uh, creating encounters that are easier to run, you can do that with a single stat block. Because we've given them multiple abilities that interact with one another, for example, in this cause problems, you are uh, encumbering creatures in those spaces, but because of a passive ability with the, the rodent swarm, they can't be encumbered. So they create advantages for themselves. And uh, when I envision a rodent swarm, I envision chaos. Uh, it doesn't need to be that way. It could also be like impending, you know, they're trying to overwhelm you. And in that case, the way that you'd use these abilities are different. So to go back to our three goals, it's purpose for being. We don't want to just throw you a stat block and say, okay, it exists. We want a rodent swarm to feel uh, interesting, to feel flavorful and like a rodent swarm. Uh, its purpose for being is that uh, you can throw these in an encounter and it can just cause problems, which can be a lot of fun for players to try to navigate. And the third goal is that they're easy to run. You roll on a, a behavior chart if you want, or you can pick out something that makes sense given the situation. And since all of these abilities follow a sort of a set of tactics, then you can, uh, you'll have an easier time running the uh, these creatures, even if you throw multiples in the same room. So to take a step back, one way that we create interest in encounters in D&D, &D, Pathfinder, that sort of thing, is by creating uh, an encounter that uses at least three creatures. You want one that's ranged, one that's melee, and one that causes problems. And that is a good guideline to operate under, but should that always be the case? When it comes to feel, your monsters should feel like more than a stat block. So before us, we have a blood fray giant. It's a huge, giant, chaotic evil. It has this chain melee weapon with 20 feet of reach, and then it deals some bludgeoning damage. Uh, it can grapple a creature, and it can restrain them. It's a very purpose-built giant. I think all giants, most giants, can throw rocks. That's something that uh, you're expecting them to rip something out of the ground and, and toss it. And then you have this reaction for furious defense, which uh, is worded really lengthily, but basically if they take damage by, from a target within 20 feet, they can make an attack against them. Does any of that evoke that it's a giant? How do you express your strength? I think the rock, and the reason why you see this in so many uh, giant stat blocks, is that it tries to do that. You try to uh, give it some leeway, you know, like, because it just says rock. Do they have a pocket full of rocks? Maybe. Uh, but I think a GM would be more likely to say, okay, they pick up this rock and then they chuck it at you. And that's an expression of strength, right? It gives us an idea for how this monster could be narrated as they're moving through combat. If you wanted to make this giant feel more like a giant, how could we do that? So if you operate it under the same sort of uh, mechanical guidelines as distal, maybe you just give it more attacks. You could give it a bonus action that allows it to just like punt a creature. You're a giant. You could just kick something. You just kick a little baby and then it goes flying. And then, you know, you push or throw or whatever the, uh, the target back, you know, a number of feet. And that allows it to then take advantage of the, the chain that it has. Uh, you could give it the ability to, uh, to knock something prone just by crushing it with their hands. Or you could uh, allow it to grab another creature and then just chuck that creature. And this, again, this giant is very purpose built. It's meant to grapple you and restrain you. But that's part of the problem with these sorts of creatures is that there isn't uh, enough when it comes to the flavor of them to make them feel like their own entity. If you threw three of these things in the same room, they'd all be doing the same things. It wouldn't really be uh, fighting in a way that is varied and feels like there is an overwhelming presence. It's very much like this is what the creature does. It's meant to attack from range and it, it grapples you. And because of that, you're going to need two other different types of giants to create an interesting encounter. Maybe. I'm sure this creature is a major threat, as uh, most giants I would expect would be. But also that depends on the godlike status of the players and what level they are. So hopefully I've given you some things to think about when it comes to approaching 
uh, maybe designing new monsters for your game, do you adhere to the same action, bonus action, reaction economy? Should you be uh, asymmetrical in that design where you're more like representing what the, the monsters want to do during specific uh, moments of the fight? How do you create the flavor for a, uh, a major creature, you know, or any creature? Does it have a purpose to exist or is it just a bag of hit points? Is it just a uh, stat block? that needs to exist because a stat block needs to exist. How are you incorporating these monsters into your encounter in a way that is easy to run, fun for the players, and isn't too much to track? If this video has been interesting, helpful, or entertaining, please feel free to like, subscribe, tell your friends about the channel. And if you have any special secrets for how you handle monsters and make encounters feel interesting, but also not wicked difficult to run, please feel free to leave those thoughts in the comment section down below. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.